Okay. Lovely to be here. Just a shame that I'm not with you in Ireland. It would have been great. Um, I don't know if you can see, I've got some pictures behind me on the wall and it's suddenly, I've never really thought about this before. It just occurred to me that I've got, if I can show you, my two Irish great grannies here. Cheery characters, both of them, as you can see. So I'm still trying to work out how I get my Irish passport for when things continue to go downhill over this side of, of the water. Anyway, without further ado, let me take you into my presentation for today. Um, this is something that is absolutely dear to my heart. Um, it is so important. We do all this really hard work in support of learning and teaching, but do we really demonstrate the value of it? And I will give you some examples of where I have tried to do that and failed and other examples where I maybe have had a bit more effect, a bit more luck with that, although it's not really luck. Um, what I hope you'll get from this is the most important thing, talk with colleagues, and it's great that you've taken the time this morning to spend time with colleagues talking through important issues. So what you talk about in the discussion groups will be really important. I'll try to offer some practical ideas to improve your practice. I'll suggest some tools that you might want to use when thinking about evidencing the value of your work. And some momentum, I would really like to think at the end about how do we keep the momentum going? Because we all know what happens at the end of a workshop. We rush back to the day job and think, yeah, that was great, right? Now what's next on the priority list? So how do we manage to get a bit of purchase on today's thinking that you can take forward? I think this is quite a good time of year to be thinking about this because you're probably planning your educational development activities for next year already. And I'll be advocating that you should be thinking about how you're going to evaluate and evidence the value of those activities before you step, before you get to this, the point of doing them. So here's what I'll, here's the format of this morning. I'll talk a little bit about where I'm coming from. I'll introduce some concepts and frameworks, give you the chance to talk about your current practices. I'll give you an, a case example of a mix of evidence that I have worked with, and then think forward to what might you do next and what are your takeaways from this. Now I will be throwing a few conceptual frameworks at you so it might be worth your while to have a pen and paper to hand so that you can jot down any notes that you think are relevant for you or because I will be asking you to think about which of these frameworks you might be able to work with. At the end, I will ask you, what are your takeaways? What, what is there that we've spoken about in this period of time that you might use in your future evidencing activities? So not what's interesting, but what might you use in practice? We don't really have the, um, the, the, the chance to spend time on nice to do's anymore, do we? Where I'm coming from is that I've been doing some research on evaluation and uh, I came up with this idea of evidencing the value for a CEDA publication a few years back. And my most recent work, this is, I don't know if anybody's seen it, it's an 80 page monograph, again for CEDA, about metrics. Um, and there were some really interesting findings. It was empirical with data from 70 odd heads of academic development, some of whom were from Ireland. Um, lots of really interesting things happening in the sector that were bubbling to the, the surface in that data. Um, this is a picture of Queen Margaret University. I've worked in lots of universities, but that was my latest one. I retired from full-time work two years ago. I can't recommend it enough. Um, I was the director for the Centre of Academic Practice at QMU, 
previous to that, another 10 years at Harriet Watts. Um, and I've chaired a number of big national projects um, like the, and I will talk in a bit more detail about what we did to evidence the value of the enhancement theme. Other projects and all of those, the, probably the stickiest challenge was how to evidence the value of what was being done. For the Danny, can I interrupt you just one second? We can't actually see your slides. Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry, Mary. What an no idiot. problem. Right. So I thought I had shared and I haven't. Talk about rookie mistakes. Ah. Right. Can you see that now? Perfect. Absolutely ah. perfect. Thanks very much, Ronnie. Thanks for stopping me. I'm, I'm so sorry for interrupting. Nobody shouted. No, that's fine. <laughs> so experience as a head of educational development for 20 years, run national projects, always struggled with how do we evidence the value of this? So I'm going to give you um, a little, uh, some ideas about some of the things that I've come across that I thought were useful over the years. But first of all, we are being no doubt that there is no escaping this. As a head of ec academic development, I hated all the stuff around league tables and surveys. And then gradually over time, I realized this stuff's very useful for educational development because we can leverage those league tables, those key performance indicators in order to help learning and teaching. And that's exactly what has come out of the, the research that I've done recently on metrics. Um, just drilling down a bit, um, if you happen to be working in your institution with learning analytics, here's Coventry writing a case study of what they have done in terms of um, bringing in income through, or at least saving money through um, using learning analytics for students at risk of leaving. So there are real pressures for us to evidence value, but I want to be clear, and that's why I've called this reimagining evidencing value because impact, you know, that's fine if you've got a meteor hitting the earth and you end up with a great big crater at the bottom. But as you know, educational work isn't like that. It's far, far more complex. Working with people, how do you evidence the value of what you do for each of the people that you work with at all the different levels that you work with? So the, this word impact is a real problem in itself, and I try not to use it, although it's in such common currency, that's, that's hard. Now, what I'd like to show you here is um, a picture of some of the members of my ex team. So when I asked the questions, why question, why should we worry about this? They were there were some great people in that team, There's about a dozen of us. And we did a re regular institutional survey. And here are here's a word cloud with the kinds of um, words that were used to describe that team. Brilliant stuff, so, so hardworking, so productive such credibility with the staff. So they worked in student support, technology enhanced learning, academic development and researcher development. And guess what? The week before I retired, nearly all of them were made redundant. And of course you can imagine how traumatic that was both for them and me a week before Christmas. It was just awful and I, have spent many hours thinking, what should I have done differently? I was leaving, the university had money problems. Should I have spent more of my energy evidencing the value of what that team were doing or not? Um, what we often say is, I've got time to do the work. I don't have time to do all that evidencing stuff. But for me, this was a salutary lesson in make sure that not only your colleagues know how helpful, supportive, approachable, friendly, knowledgeable, etc., you are, but that senior management have a very clear message that they can't escape. So that's one reason why it's very important that educational developers um, 
do the work of evidencing. And in my recent work on metrics, what came out from across the sector is that educational development units are being given far less discretion as to what kind of work they will do. This is in the UK, it may be different in Ireland. Far less discretion, it is being much more managerially driven and resourcing is following the KPIs. If your educational development unit is supporting those, those strategic agendas, you're likely to carry on being resourced. So this in the UK, and I'm sure it will be similar in Ireland, is not going away. This is the, the culture that we're living in. And Parsons wrote a few years back that resources or funding will start to dry up or be marshaled elsewhere unless we can demonstrate, unless we can show what that impact is that we are having. So how do we do that? Okay. What I'm advocating is a structured, planned, highly contextualized approach to evidencing value. It will look different for each of you in your contexts and depending on what you are, um, what you're evidencing, but we'll have a, a, a talk about those different things as we go through. This sounds very managerial, but obviously you, we are constantly adapting what we do and the evidencing that we do will also be constantly adapted. So just to make sure that we are clear, what am I talking about when I talk about evidence? It's not that gold standard of random control trials. Um, it's a guide to what we think is happening in a particular situation. Evidence is a sign of what is happening. One piece of evidence on its own is never normally enough, as I will show. And if we're going to be evidence informed, we need to bring together data from a number of sources. But what's really important is that we put our experience, our judgment and our expertise into interpreting those data and saying, here's what's actually happening. So it's not enough to say we've got um, a, a retention problem. 500 students are at risk of leaving unless you can look underneath that and find out what is going on for those students. That doesn't mean to say your data can be raggedy. They have to be robust, but the word proportion is very important. You're all going to say, I've got too much work on, I can't do this, but think what's proportionate in your situation. I just said before, we have to triangulate different sources. And this is, for me is really important. This is a, a lovely publication by Etienne Wenger et al. And it's within community settings, but talking about evidencing the value of work within those community settings. For me, the key point is numbers on their own are not enough. Stories on their own are not enough. They need to support each other. The, the numbers will give you the patterns of what seems to be happening. The stories will explain what is going on with those patterns. It will be different according to our particular context. And we have to let people know how we're using evidence, how we're producing evidence. And then that really hard thing of how do we apply it appropriately? Um, you know, how do you get senior managers who say they don't want to read more than a page? You know, I did a beautiful annual report of all the wonderful things that my department were doing. Did senior managers ever read that? I'm not sure. So how do we get our stories across effectively? Now, what I'd be interested to know is what are your challenges in evidencing value? What are the things that you struggle with? Now, I'm going to ask you to go into small group discussions at this stage. I don't want you to come back and say, we don't have enough money, we don't have enough resources, they're our biggest challenges. I don't have enough time, that's my biggest challenge. Okay, forget those, 
because they're always going to be there. I want you to think about the things that are the kind of wicked issues that you might be able to do something about. Um, I don't think we're going to be able to do anything about time or money because they're always going to be in short supply. So Mary and Sinead are going to put you into groups. I would like you to think about maybe a very specific situation where you would like to gather evidence and use it and it's not working or you don't know how to do it. Talk about it in your groups and a spokesperson to come back with a couple of people, a couple of ideas, sorry. Okay, see you in 15 minutes. Are we all back? Um, could I ask the spokesperson for each of the, the groups? How many groups have we got, Mary and Sinead? We have five groups in total running. Oh, that's not bad. Great. So if I could ask the spokesperson for each of the groups, just to summarise two minutes, um, what were the key things, the key challenges that were highlighted in your groups, please? I was in group one. Um, and so I'll just kind of briefly read the comments. But if anybody if, wants to correct me in my group, please do. Um, one of the biggest challenges uh, that we talked about was the work. Uh, doing the work is one thing, um, but balancing then with the workload, with gathering the evidence was another issue. Um, and then uh, one of the other comments was pulling together the data from multiple sources is time consuming. Um, and, and what is management looking for? Sorry, I put on my camera. Um, what is management looking for? So, you know, from all of these multiple streams. Um, and then there's also a balance between, you know, robust content and multiple forms of evidence and concise information that management would read or look at or um, I, you know, take the time to, to, to um, I suppose, understand. Um, getting people to value qualitative evidence rather than metrics was another um, comment that was made. Um, and lack in buy-in as to the importance of this evidence and what the evidence is, um, and what evidence is acceptable or, or, or is to be used or what will, they be, under, what will be understood. Um, and then also another comment that was made was that management may have come from a more scientific background and may not understand the qualitative nature of, uh, of evidence as well. Um, also strategic direction can be unclear. Um, so it's difficult to evidence impact if you don't have specific goals set out from the outset. Um, and also the short, medium and long-term nature of evidence, um, you know, when you're, when you're setting goals at the outset, it may be just a short impact, but actually um, uh, the, the butterfly effect was mentioned. So uh, while impact may appear minimal at the start, over time that will grow um, and we need to wait for that particular impact of evidence as well. So um, again, not clearly defining the goals, um, it, it makes it more difficult to record and demonstrate the evidence. Um, and also the role of academic developers is more focused on working with staff rather than directly with students. So uh, it, it's difficult when you don't have that third space, um, when you don't have direct contact with that third space um, to, to record the evidence. Uh, and it adds a layer of complexity in gathering that type of evidence. So they were the bulk of our comments. If there's anything extra, if I haven't, wasn't clear on some parts, just let me know. Wow, a lot there. Thanks very much, Sinead. <laughs> okay, that I think shows the extent of what we're struggling with here. Hopefully we'll come up with some challenges, not so answers to the challenges as well, or potential answers. Okay, thank you. Who's group two? I think that might be us. I couldn't throw to it, but I think it might be. Okay, thanks. Go ahead. Um, so I think we had lots of similar points to Sinead, so I'm not going to dwell on them. But key questions that came up were, again, these ideas of cost-benefit evaluation. So 
what do we mean by success? What do we see as success? And how do we measure success? And how do those align with value systems for what success is from policy writers, from, from kind of senior, from, from the senior leadership from on high? Um, the big questions about mismatch of goals, and we talked a bit about um, investing in staff being our priority and how that theoretically leads to learning gain for students and where that sits against a backdrop of ever increasing precarity. Um, the university isn't struggling to attract talent. So where's the argument for the institution to invest in its talent if it's viewing it as kind of as a two, year, two to three year maximum, two to five year turnover. Um, and then we had a lot of focus and a lot of discussion around gap um, in, in different ways. So we're talking about language gaps and that mismatch between agendas, between jargons, between ways of thinking, um, a gap in understanding between orientation of the institution, um, the rise of kind of managerialism in the university leadership. Our, view, our kind of core values as developers are quite often much more oriented towards education as a public good, towards providing a service to society. And also that kind of orientation gap that's, that's not just about value systems, but also about professional backgrounds in, in a context where the vast majority overwhelmingly of university senior leadership come from extremely strong research backgrounds, perhaps rather than very strong teaching backgrounds. Um, which kind of leads more towards metrics, uh, metrics of product from a research orientation rather than trying to measure process and, and provoke change, which is where, where we sit. Brilliant, thanks very much, Johnny. Lots there as well. Thank you. Group three. Hi, Ronnie, um, I'll speak for group three. Um, we, we did cover many of the um, topics that have already been mentioned, so I'll add a few others. Um, we had one member of our group who was an educational developer and therefore works in, a, in the department of, um, I guess, teaching, Centre for Teaching and Learning. And the discussion we had there was that, for first of all, it's many of the same members of staff who focus on the development of their teaching and learning, whereas others uh, don't do so, so much. And that means that it can be quite difficult to share the stories amongst everybody. Some members of staff won't necessarily mention what they're doing. Um, another point raised there was um, when you are part of an, in an institution that is so focused on using the statistics, it can be harder to convey the developments in teaching and learning as stories. So that in itself is a challenge. Uh, then we moved on to uh, discussing the fact that what one person considers innovative may not be innovative to somebody else perhaps they do that all the time you know we get we discuss the example of somebody putting their teaching material on the VLE for the first time and that could be a huge achievement for them whereas for somebody else who does that all the time that wouldn't necessarily be considered an innovation so how do you balance the appreciation of what is innovative or not um, and then we briefly touched on the challenges, this was more sort of my, my personal experience, but the challenges of getting buy-in from colleagues when your execution and perhaps collection of um, evidence to just to, to speak to the impact of that um, innovation requires their, their collaboration as well. If they're not as willing to participate, that can be quite difficult. And equally planning ahead for you know, the execution of this project and the collection of the data at the end, when you perhaps do have these very strong research colleagues around you, but not as many colleagues who are focused on teaching and learning, that, that can also be difficult because then you're having to learn all of that for yourself in real time and make sure that you don't miss the opportunity to capture the evidence at the end. Thanks, Chana. That's great. Thank you. Um, group four. Hello, I'm Pauline. Um, so a lot of similar themes really about kind of mismatch of values, um, about what constitutes good teaching and how to evidence it really. Um, so people were talking about how senior management will prefer the bigger numbers and kind of harder figures related to cost or to retention. And if you teach small groups, and that's often the case with postgraduate study, um, you, you just will never have that 
that kind of um, metric to to bring and you and coming up with ways of of engaging senior management around how you do and how what you do and how you make changes and how your students feel about it as a challenge um so a similar theme around that the qualitative evidence maybe being what you often use to base your changes and teaching on but that's not really recognized or valued in the same way by those you have to present your your changes to um the the anonymous versus non-anonymous kind of survey. So the idea of getting information from students, um, separating out the teaching from liking a subject or general stress levels or fatigue or kind of COVID online um, stuff. There's an awful lot going on for students and actually doing that in a survey well is quite, um, is quite sophisticated. And I'm not sure that the surveys really get that much thought and attention. And they tend to be delivered at a time of year when they're tired and, and have an opportunity to rant. Um, and that can be tricky then to, to negotiate uh, because it's seen as the more objective, harder kind of evaluation of teaching. Um, and also the survey fatigue, both for, for students and for, for lecturers. And um, certainly for, from my perspective, teaching in health science, what you can actually make changes in realistically um, while you have a lot of, of, of accreditation and regulatory requirements. So the extent to which you can emphasize or de-emphasize um, areas or come up with innovative teaching um, and assessment can sometimes be a bit challenging. So those were some of the additional things I think we, we talked about and that we perhaps ourselves need to define and, and advocate for different evidence. And that's part of the change um, that, that needs to happen so that we, we make that definition and we advocate for, for the evidence that we think is most useful and meaningful. Is that it? Unless there's anything else people want to add. Thanks, Pauline. And the final group. I think that might be me, unless somebody wants to come in. Thanks, um, Moira. Um, well, uh, I suppose some of the um, same issues that have come up already. We had a mixed group. Some of us were uh, based in learning and teaching centres. Um, others were focused on assessing the impact of uh, of teaching and, and learning interventions and, and approaches. But I suppose for us, the big challenges we identified came down to having a process and a structure to do it. Um, and we had different examples and talked around it, but really that was that was um, what we identified as the, the key challenge. And um, we looked at some ways of approaching solutions for that. I don't know if anyone else wants to come in there. Maybe not. You're on your own. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank, thanks, Maura. No, I think she captured what we had in our group. It's just to have some sort of thing process, as she says, or structure in advance before you, you're, you're doing things so that you're gathering the evidence. And, and Maura herself made the good point about using times like the programmatic reviews and institutional reviews as part of that whole process. Thanks, and I think Maura. Thanks, that's great. Okay, so much there. Um, I would like to just pick out one or two points um, that you have mentioned. Some of them are so problematic. I don't know that we'll ever find easy answers. It's never that simple, is it? We're constantly navigating our way around these issues. But things like, um, Jen, Johnny mentioned, what do we mean by success versus what do senior managers mean by success? And um, I think you also talked about the rise of managerialism versus typical educational values as education as public good. And that's a struggle that's not going to go away. And as I said earlier in the metrics publication I did, it came through very clearly that that's a tightrope that developers are going to have to keep, um, keep walking. And there's a, a especially an issue perhaps with managers from scientific research backgrounds who don't value the type of qualitative data that we would normally be producing um, within our work. So for, for me, this is about having um, a very political awareness of what is it that you really need to demonstrate? What is the bottom line in your institution? And I have to say, I've, I've always been a bit cavalier about this because I've always thought we'll manage, we'll manage upwards. We'll, 
you know, help the senior managers to find their way through the learning and teaching strategy, etc. because we're the enlightened ones as developers, but actually when it comes to it, they're holding the purse strings. So how do you hit that bottom line that they really need to hit? So if we have key performance indicators where progression and retention are real problems, how do we in our different ways demonstrate a contribution to trying to help the, the institution with those problems. So there's a political thing there. And also um, thinking about what kind of relationship have you got with the people who are of influence? It's so important to get them on board. And in our group, there was a mention of externality. So what externality have you got? Um, who's out there advocating for you? Who do you bring in? In our group, it was an external examiner who was mentioned. But I think that we need to be a lot more creative in thinking about which voices do we bring into this discussion? Okay, we've got students, we've got staff, um, we've got research, etc. But who else can we use in, in, in putting forward our case? Part of that is us being able to define the purpose of our evidencing. So what is it? And also the purpose of the projects that we're doing. Um, and we'll talk a bit more about this later, but very important to be able to identify what do we want to do and how do we want to do it and where is it going? Um, that will make it a lot easier to navigate around this morass of possible ways forward for for the data that's out there. The, um, I was saying before about the bottom line, and I mentioned earlier about proportionality. It seems to me that there is evidencing for different purposes at different levels. So in our group, for example, there was, how do we evidence our own performance for career progression? Very important. So what are you doing on a regular basis that is gathering that evidence for your next step. Um, just small things like, I know, for example, I always have had an email folder called to cherish. The emails that would either cheer me up on a, on a bad day or that I might be able to pick bits out of next time I wanted to, to make a, a, a career, um, a promotion application. So think about the data that you might use for the bottom line, the KPIs, the data that you might use for your own career progression, what might you need in between at programme level? Have you got a clear idea? Because we tend to keep hitting this whole thing about surveys. And as you have said, we're fed up with them. Students are, set, are fed up with them. What are the alternatives? And I think I've put in a slide earlier on because I worked out at one stage, what are all the sources of evidence that inform the performance of a particular programme of an academic course of study? And there's loads of things, you know, what do the, the librarians say about what our students are achieving? Um, lots of different sources to think about. Um, the final thing I will say in response to your discussion, and this came out in very strongly in the metrics work I've just done, is the need for training. And I don't mean just for us, I also mean for senior managers, and I don't know how you tell your senior managers that they need to be trained, but probably the biggest gripe from all the developers who contributed to my survey about um, metrics, the biggest gripe was misuse of data, underuse of data, poor skewed use of data from people who really were not um, li literate in using data. So how do we get some training in place for both ourselves and for senior managers? Um, I've been really jealous, for example, of a colleague in another university who managed to get a statistician into their team 
so they have got somebody there who has who is able to access the university systems the the learning analytics and use that data for a bit of leverage in their academic development work so think about training for you and what would help you to do all of this more more effectively because it is hard stuff um i could go on um did I mention advocates? Who's advocating for you? I think who you make friends with in the institution, I think I might have mentioned senior managers, very important. Is there anything anybody else wants to say about that discussion before we move on to looking at some concepts that might help us? Okay, so I'll go on to back into my little presentation. So we've been talking about the imperative for um, evidencing the value of our work and you're clearly aware of that from those discussions. The sticky bit is how. So let's um, go on to some conceptual frameworks to think about how you might frame your evidencing. If you put the thinking into how you're going to do it, there are tools out there. There are loads of tools for doing it. It's getting um, a shared understanding in your team about how you're going to do it and what you're going to use. You may be aware of the concept of the theory of change. And this is a starting point. How can you say what you have achieved and how well you've performed if you don't know where you're going or where you're coming from or how you're going to get there. And I think we tend to jump into things. Let me give you an example. There is um, a lot of use in amongst qualitative evidence of case studies. And we, we rush out and we ask for case studies and we produce case studies, assuming that everybody knows that, of course, sharing case studies will mean sharing learning. I'm not actually sure that's the case. I've not found many academic colleagues, for example, who are willing or interested or see the point of, of, of learning from people outside their discipline. That can be a real barrier if the case study is in a different discipline. That's just one example. So what's the theory of change behind using something like case studies? So theory of change, important concept. Anybody who's a Blade Runner fan, any Blade Runner fans amongst you? The Android, uh, I think the question, the, the, I've forgotten, is it Rut, uh, Rutger, whatever his name is, the white haired guy. At the end, he says something like, where, how, where am I going? How long have I got? Where have I come from? Something like this. And those are the questions that we need to ask ourselves when we are embarking on um, a, a project and hoping to evidence the value of it. Um, what that comes down to is the situation analysis. Where are we at now? What are we trying to get to our objectives? What resources have we got? What actions might we be able to take? And what outcomes will we achieve as a result of that? Now you may do that in your teams, but in all the teams I've ever worked in, it's very unusual for somebody to elucidate that particular, um, that uh, a theory of change approach. And it's something that I would advocate as a starting point because it then gives you a platform for moving on. It makes explicit your expect expectations about how that change will happen. So if you think of a particular project, so I might think of, for example, I've done projects on master's level work. So what's happening in my institution in terms of supporting master's students? Where are we trying to get to in terms of moving on with that? How are we going to get people on board with it? And how will we know whether some, anything has changed as a result? And like all of these ideas, 
they're very important for educational developers. Our work is so political. We need to be able to articulate very clearly what we're trying to do and how we're going to get there. It's also important for people who are not educational developers because we're all involved in some kind of development that we want to demonstrate. So then you embark on the evidencing process because that evidence will demonstrate to what extent your theory of change has worked. So if I say that in, in terms of master's um, students, if we find that master's students tell us that they have a much better understanding of what's expected at master's level, if we find that staff are marking much more consistently, if we're getting good um, results from our master's level courses, then that will tell us to what extent our work on master's support has, has helped. So think as we're going through about particular instances and what the evidence might look like in your area of work. And I'll give you the chance, after we've done this generic bit, I'll give you the chance to, to talk about that. So think specific, think of particular projects and, and innovations that you would like to evidence. Now, some of you are familiar with this, it's been around for a while. Um, I actually developed this uh, with my husband, in a bar in Estonia on a very wet afternoon when we decided not to wander the streets and sat down and started talking about this. Um, so um, the idea is that there are different types of evidence and we tend to gather that in a haphazard fashion. But if you pick out the types of evidence, then maybe you'll have a better balance and you'll have different types of evidence that you can apply in different ways. So I mentioned purpose. There is the evidence that will hold sway with senior managers. There's evidence that you, you might like to use for your career progression application. Think about types of evidence and how you might use them. So the research evidence is the, the published stuff usually. Evaluation is usually what people tell you, usually in a, a semi-formal kind of way about how their experiences have helped them, what the value of um, the work has been to them. And practice wisdom is a far less acknowledged um, area of work. And you will have difficulties with your science research managers in talking about this, but actually they know this intuitively. And it's the intangibles. Um, one of the recent publications from one of our Scottish enhancement themes was about how do we demonstrate the value of the intangibles? For example, we know very well that students having a sense of belonging and staff having a sense of belonging is really important. Try measuring that, you're not going to. But student stories, for example, and staff stories can demonstrate it. There's the things that we know from corridor talk, the things that we know just won't work or will work in our discipline area. And that local knowledge is really important. How do we bring it to bear in our evidencing process is tricky, but it can be done. They're not the only ingredients. I mentioned earlier Sandra Nutley talking about how we have to bring our more judgment, contextual knowledge, experience to bear on all of this evidence that, that we're gathering. So if you think about the pandemic, for example, we've got these high level committees like SAGE in the UK who are looking at the evidence, but they're also looking at what they know from experience about what tends to happen with pandemics, with the way that people behave. And those interpretive, interpretive tools are really important. Of course, if you're going to use them, 
then it helps if you make it clear that you're using them. So maybe the next time you do, a, let's say, a, a report, if you give a brief statement on the methodology for how your evidence was gathered, you can acknowledge that you have brought into the, the picture some, some important contextual factors. So how do we put these pieces of that jigsaw together in our own practice? And I like matrices, so I use a grid and I call it the evidence mix planning grid. And here's an example here. Um, here are those three areas of evidence, research and theory, evaluation, practice wisdom, the types of data or evidence that we might have access to or that we might plan to collect under each of those. And then thinking about a particular context, what are the specifics in that context? So I've got one of these for my master's programme work, for example, um, where I, I, and it doesn't take a long time to do this. Once you've done one, it's, it's actually very quick, but it's a really helpful process to go through in your team to get them to focus on what can we bring together? Obviously, you can only do what is realistic for you at that point. Proportionality is important. But just thinking in this structured way about what might we bring together is helpful. And that framework, which I have just shown you, has been used by the Irish Network um, to create an online tool and that is available to you, um, for available to anybody to use, but they, they use that, that particular framework to, to design that tool. So you'll see there is, what does the theory tell us that can help our evidencing and the research, consultation and evaluation, what are people telling us, practice change, um, what is happening, what are the testimonies and the student outcomes, so the, the, that tool has already been developed for you and a very useful one it is too. Again, I think the, the biggest value is in using that in your team to work out how are we going to um, plan this year's evaluation of our PG CERT, of a, an innovation on the VLE or whatever it might be. I'm going to mention a couple of other things very quickly before we have a break. So that was one framework. I'm sure you will be familiar with Kirkpatrick, which is the classic four levels of how do we demonstrate the impact of our work. And our feedback questionnaires that we use in workshops tend to, to follow one and two. You know, did people turn up? Did they like it? Did they say that they learned anything from what we did? Did they take anything back into their department, for example, from that? And what are the results? Are things happening? So that's Kirkpatrick. So you might find that resonates for you more than what I have just described, or you might find that they complement each other because none of these things are exclusive. Um, Brookfield's four lenses, if we're thinking about gathering data, for example, from different sources, there's our own lens, our students, our peers and the scholarship lens, and that's partly encapsulated in the evidence mix triangle as well. But if you, let's say, for example, that you are doing your annual reports for your department, putting a little model of framework like this at the beginning is helpful in just demonstrating to the readers, for example, senior managers, that you have some theoretical thinking behind what you're presenting to them. Um, I mentioned to you earlier that I had sat down and brainstormed the range of evidence that we have available at the programme level. So on our PG certs or what, whatever other programme we might be in, involved in supporting, 
Yeah. <coughs> Surveys and module evaluation are fine. Do we pay due attention to what specific groups are experiencing? Do we get data from professional services? Do we look carefully at things like employability? Do the new lecturers doing our PG certs, for example, have a different career trajectory than what they might have done? And who are those, ex where, where does your externality come from? So again, sitting down and looking at some a device like this with your team, you might decide that most of this is irrelevant, but there are four things that you can pick out from here in order to frame your process and your planning of how you evidence your work. This is one that I've used a lot, which is rough data. Rough data is reasons for what you're evaluating or evidencing. What use will you put the data to? What is your focus? What data will you collect? Who's going to read it? When will you do it? Who's going to do it? That's the hard one. Usually me when it comes to it in each of your cases. So I have done a rough data version of um, how we support master's students, for example, or how we are going to evaluate our PG cert in the coming year. And it really sharpens the thinking. So all of this, what I've been showing you, both rough data and what has preceded, has been about taking a structured, planned approach, knowing that it is all going to go overboard once we start. And I'll show you a good example of that later, where I've completely messed up what was planned and had to go down a different route altogether. But having a plan doesn't mean to say you can't change your plan. It means you've got a plan that is a guide it's not a, something that you have to stick to rigidly. Finally, the QAA in Scotland have produced a planner, which I think is very useful because it takes you through the time periods. So if it's a particular VLE project, for example, when are we going to collect the different sorts of data? What are we going to do? What, when are we going to do it? All of that is put onto a planner and that's on the QA website. Have I not given you a, a break yet? That's ridiculous. I think we're ready for a break now, do you? Um, Mary and Sinead, I think people have done enough listening. How about if we have a 10 minute break for people to get their, oh yeah, Katrina's saying definitely, they told me that. My husband just told me that this webinar would go much better if you could see my slippers, but I'm not convinced by that. <laughs> so um, I will just go back to the PowerPoint. And I would like to give you an example, a specific example of what we've just been talking about. And then I'm going to ask you to talk about your examples in groups. <clears throat> So this relates to, can everybody see that? Is that okay? Just nod if you, yeah, great, thank you. Okay, this example relates to, um, I'm sure you're aware of the enhancement themes in Scotland. So this was a three-year project, very complex, multi-level between 19 universities. I chaired the theme um, um, with coordination from the Quality Assurance Agency. Now, at the start, I thought, OK, situation analysis, where are we all at? And I decided against the um, better judgment of QAA colleagues that what we should do would be to benchmark where we're at now. And the topic was student transitions and repeat that at the end of the three year theme. Very obvious to me that that would be the right way to go. So we designed um, a document which we asked all institutions to complete with their data. 
where we asked them to indicate what was the, what were their practices in supporting student transitions at the institutional level, department level, um, the individual level, and what was the student union doing as well? Well, we got page, we got such complexity back, 20 pages at least from each institution. The poor devil who had the job of analysing it could not come up with anything sensible as a result. And we, as we see in Scotland, the game's a bogey. It was just not, it was just dreadful. So we I had to go with my tail between my legs and tell all the institutional reps that we weren't going to continue with that particular attempt. It just did not work. But then what we did was develop a logic model, and I will show you the logic model in a minute. So I shut the other key people involved in a room for a day, and we produced a logic model. And out of the logic model came for a, a plan for our evidence mix for the three years of the theme, which we then went over iteratively in the course of the theme. Now, I don't know if you've heard of logic models. It will look like yet another managerialist tool. And in some ways it is, but it's very powerful. If you are working on a project and you can show senior managers on one page what you're going to do and what you're going to achieve, there's a chance they might look at it. So here's the, uh, the, mo the logic mo a logic model. So we've got the aims of the project, the objectives, what we will have by the end, what's the strategy for achieving that, what activities will we do, what outputs will there be, and what will indicate success or otherwise. And you can read the colours going across. So if our first objective was to improve understanding across the universities of what successful student transitions are, these were the outcomes, the red bits. The strategy was to identify and develop good practice. The activities were about producing examples, a repository of good practice, briefing papers. The outputs were briefing papers, case examples, etc. And we came up with the idea of a transitions map. And these were the indicators. So this didn't actually take that long to do, but by the end of a day, we had an agreed aim for the whole of three years of work. We knew what our objectives were going to be, and we knew what it was we were going to have to evidence in the course of that, um, that work. So that's a, an example of a logic model. And I have used that for a number of projects now, and it's always given me good guidance on what is it we're meant to be doing again? When you, you know, you, you, you're talking with colleagues and you think, oh yeah, we could do X and Y. Well, no, that's taking us off at a tangent. Let's stick to what we have planned here. And this is very helpful for doing it. For that transitions enhancement theme, Here's a very simple evidence grid. So here were the sources, the published sources that we were going to use, including bringing in some of those published researchers. Here are the people we were consulting. Here's the student data we were using. And here is some of the practice wisdom that we were planning to, to try and collect. So you can see this is very high level. And then you drill down from here and you can drill down using something like a year long planner to say, well, in year one, we're going to do some focus groups. We're going to do the research, um, the theoretical research. In year two, we're going to consult employers, etc. So this is a, an example of a planning grid coming out of um, a logic model which uses the three types of data that were in that model. So here's um, a slide that I put up at the final conference for the theme. And there was a real punch to the numbers 
you know, if you can say we have produced 900 resources for this theme, there have been over 20,000 page views on the web pages. Those numbers are the indicators that you need to, in our case, to show government. Um, but they're not sufficient in themselves. What they show is a certain level of engagement. What you need are other things. So you've got the engagement analytics, which is what you've got here. We also then went into the qualitative evidencing cycle and look for examples of changed practices, cases, some lovely videos of students talking, for example, about the transition support they had received in their institutions. Something very intangible, we articulated the benefits of collaborative working. Very powerful to be able to say 19 universities worked together on this and here's some of the sharing between us. And then we have a transitions map and all of this is up there on the website if anybody is interested. So can you see the process we went through? Here's our theory of what we want to do. Here's our logic model. Here are the engagement analytics, how many people paid any attention to what we did. And here are some of the qualitative outputs at the end of it. That was a big project, but small projects, you can still do something very similar. If you think about these things, you know, how many people have looked at your web pages for a, a particular piece of work? How many people have come along to events, for example? Very importantly, how many people have you involved or engaged in doing this work? Have you had people from each of your departments, each of your discipline areas involved? So the, these figures are really important. They have, they demonstrate impact. And then we see the real stories that underlie them. And the most powerful stories were the ones from the students. So we had a group of students from the Royal Conservatoire who did a performance so performance can also be evidence at a national conference in which they talked about their transition experiences and the pain and the difficulty of not feeling like you belong when you first arrive at university. And that performance spoke volumes, I think, to politicians as well as to people within universities. Right, you've had your break, don't get excited, you're not having another one. So um, what I would like to go into now is, what can you do in your context? So I've given you an example of what I have done. I've done similar things within my institution and I've said that some have worked, some certainly haven't, but what would work for you? So I would like you to think about what are your options for evidencing value and I'd like you to think about it individually and then do some small group discussion on it. So you're not going to go into your small groups initially, just like students, we need thinking time too. So I'm going to ask you to think about a specific evidencing challenge. It might be a service, an innovation, a project, an activity. It might be your whole workshop program. And I'd like you to think about how you could plan the evidencing process for that particular project. When would you do this stuff? Who might you involve? How would you do it? What's the process? And which approaches and tools might you use? And I'm going to give you just a few minutes to think about that on your own. Just to refresh your minds, I'm going to whiz you back through some of these things that I've mentioned in case you want to think about particular tools. So I've talked about the evidence mix and different sources of data. 
I've talked about using a planning grid and there is the Eden planning tool. We mentioned Kirkpatrick and the levels of outcome from what we do. We mentioned Brookfields for lenses. Who's, that's about whose voices are appear in our evidence. And the, the missing one for me, of course, is the externality thing. Who externally might we also include? And senior managers, very importantly. If we're talking about evidencing the value of a particular program, what kind of data might we use for that? And this is the rough data planning tool for thinking about what your purpose is, what your focus is, what data you might collect. And then there's the time thing. And one of the groups mentioned this morning about long term and short term data collection. That's a really important point. I've always wanted to do a project where I would get, for example, the um, the, the graduates from our PG Cert learning and teaching five years and 10 years after they have finished, because that's very often when they appreciate what they learned during the program. So yeah, time span as well. Now, here we are, you've got five minutes or a few minutes of working individually to sip your tea and think about your own specific project or innovation or activity that you would like to evidence the value of. And in a, when you finish that, I'll ask you to go into groups and share your thinking with colleagues. Any questions about that or is everybody OK just to get on with it? OK. I'll give you a few minutes, about four minutes to do your thinking.
Is that long enough or do you think you need more time? Is it okay? Yeah? Okay, so I will ask you to go into your groups. Um, Mary and Sinead, if you can do your magic. Hello. <laughs> Waiting. Are all the groups back, do you think? I think yeah. so. Great. I think so. Okay, so it's always the same in academic development work, isn't it? There are, the sessions are never long enough for us to share our thinking, but that was really just giving you the chance to dip your toes into a conversation, which I hope you will get the chance to, to continue. Um, could we have um, a share, share, pair and compare kind of feedback now. So could group one, can you tell us what you were discussing and what your key ideas were? Who was group one? Group one got lost. Okay, let's go to group two. It was group two. I think that was the Trinity colleagues. We're in group two. Ah, great. Okay. So who's going to speak from that group? Pauline, do you want to? Everybody hates doing this, don't they? No, yeah. That's fine. That's, um, we, we had a, a, a brief chat about um, a particular project that uh, we're working on called Digital by Design, which is basically about building digital capacity, building capacity for digital education across Trinity. Um, we had some discussion about how we, one of the phases of the project is research to find out what's happening in digital education within the disciplines. And we had discussion about um, how, how, how to even incentivize, like one of the challenges we face even at the start of the project is how to incentivize staff to engage with us. Um, we talked about the kind of language sometimes that we have to use, you know, the sales pitch, you know, come and speak with us and this is what we, you know, you can hope to, to gain. Um, we talked about uh, the more immediate um, impacts, the, the medium term impacts and the longer term impacts and the kind of challenges um, around planning for um, evidencing impact at those levels. Um, we really, it was quite short, we really started to get going. <laughs> if anybody else wants to come in there and summarise, please do. I've missed anything. I think I think we did derive value from um, Ronnie's logic model, and just to be, I, I think, did we get to sort of agreement that that could have real application for us, even though the project is already other underway? I think that's the point that. Um, even if you're midstream, there might be value in using some of the modules. Is that fair, Pauline? Or I know it's more your it's your project. Yeah. yeah. No, I missed part of this session, so I, I'm I'm playing catch up here, Cecily. So yeah, I think that's fair. I think yeah, we discussed that uh, David before the idea of moving from the rough plan to the logic model as a way forward. Okay, thanks very much, folks. Um, group three, where are you? Who got the short straw in group three? Is, was anybody in group three? Or have we lost everybody at 12 o'clock? 
I think I can't remember what group we are. I don't know if anyone in my group can remember which one we were. I think, I think there may be some. I think it, people might have forgotten, or is it only Tomorrow, me? I'm just thinking we might have been group one now. <laughs> oh. <laughs> We're coming in late, but I think we might be. Right, brilliant. Rushing and Moira, would you like to tell us group one now that you know who you are? <laughs> It took us a while there, Ronnie, sorry, <laughs> to work out. We hadn't noted our room number. Um, yeah, it was great. Just I think there was five of us in total there just sharing what we were doing in terms of the challenges of evidencing and um, the value. Um, some of us were at the start of a project and trying to plan ahead. So this is excellent timing in terms of us considering at the outset, you know, what, what models and approaches would best fit our context. And then some of the other examples were at the end where equally they felt that the, um, the, the, the models could be then sort of even applied at this particular point in time. Um, everybody was really taken with the power of the infographic at the end. And um, the example you shared was particularly resonated with people because sometimes infographics can be a bit overpowering with too much data and information. So it, it was very clear in terms of the numbers there and um, to be able to speak to certain audiences and then there could be other sort of data sitting behind that and the, that whole notion then of the intangibles and the, the practice wisdom was probably the sort of the key learning that across our examples that people spoke about um, and they could all see how important that was and, and to look at the best ways of doing that within their own projects. I think that was it, Moira. Is there any other pieces? I think you summed it up perfectly, Roisin. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Um, is there a group three or a group four? Or would anybody anybody just like to speak up for whatever group you were in? Forget about the numbers. I can speak for the UL group if the others are happy yeah. to. Um, I clicked on a room and didn't take any notice of the number sorry Fine. so um people just shared their practice it was very in our their project plans it was very interesting to see how people had chosen very different models for the different projects so we were thinking about adapting the model and the choice that we use being really important to the project type that they'd work in different ways um, i think one of the learning points was that designing the evaluation into the project at the outset was really, really important. And thinking about it from the outset was really important, that impact piece, because sometimes we go ahead and we do what we want to do, and then we have to figure out how to evaluate it. Um, um, you know, some were taken to Kirkpatrick, someone else was using Brookfields. Um, the evaluation grid came up. I think what was really valuable there, we spoke a little bit about the practice wisdom again, like Rasheen's group. Um, so I think just designing it in at the outset and um, adapting the model to the appropriate context was really important um, without getting into any of the specifics of any of the projects. I don't know, others may want to chime in there. Thanks, Edith. Okay, anybody, which group have we not heard from? Would anybody like to speak up for another group? No, one, two, three. Well, that's fine. Okay, interesting stuff coming up again. Um, a couple of things that I've taken from what you've just been discussing. That point that Ida just made the model that actually isn't important, it's the thinking that's important. So as long as you can get that thinking done in advance, especially, then that's the key thing. Then you can find um, something to drape, drape it around. Although I think if you have got a model, it makes it a lot easier to do the thinking. So if you've got something like rough data and you know you've got seven questions to answer, or if you're working with your Eden online impact tool, you've got a 10 or whatever it is questions to answer. That's much easier to get through rather than a focus 
an unfocused discussion. So that thinking, if you've already started something, is it okay to retrofit? Is it okay to do the thinking, you know, partway through? I certainly think it is. It's better to do that than not to do it at all. And if you have anything written down, then you can come back to it and say, does this still apply? How, what, what has changed? Where do we need to go next? And um, you were mentioning, I think, Cicely, about the logic model. Can you do one mid-project? And you certainly can because you're, you're revisiting it and updating it as you go along anyway. So I think that that's very helpful at any point. What's clear to me is that at the start of a project, if you're working in a team, unless somebody takes leadership of this, it's not going to happen. So, you know, you've got somebody who convenes meetings, but who's going to take the responsibility for making sure that the evidencing gets done? And that's a question to ask your team at the beginning. Um, I've always found it very helpful to have planning days. I'm sure you use planning days as well but planning days for team working for our general work but also for specific projects so that on the way along you can revisit what your aims are to what extent you're achieving them and it's very helpful I think to invite different stakeholders along to parts of your planning day at least so you know would a, a, you invite a couple of senior managers along for part of it to involve them in, in, the, in that thinking. And that brings me to the question that the Trinity Group brought up, which is the question of engagement, which is a whole other question really that we struggle with in development work. Um, I, I, I know that I had, my, my team used to poo poo it but at least I had it as a point of reference. I had an engagement plan. So how is this team meant to engage with senior management, with academics in different schools, externally, with collaborative partners? And then we had different forms of communication that would be used in that engagement process. So we might have a newsletter for academics, for example, social media for working with students or whatever it might be but that was part of the planning before you even get to the evidencing stage have you got anybody on board that you are going to be working with and if you work out what your forms of communication are with those different constituencies then in a way you've got the start of a process of evidencing one thing that came up in our group that I thought was really interesting was learning to pitch what you're doing. So we've not talked so far about what do you do with all your evidence when you've got it together. Um, so, you know, do you stick it into a report again that doesn't get read by anybody apart from yourself and your granny? Or... You know, are you going for infographics? How do you learn to pitch on social media was one of the things that people mentioned in our group. So that for me is a training and development issue for educational developers. We really need to learn. Once we have gathered evidence, how do we pitch it in the right way for the right people? And I don't think anybody's likely to tell us or help us to do that unless we can do that work for ourselves. Um, the other thing, the, the, group, and the, the group I was in was talking about a specific project. And what I felt was that we write stuff down for projects and then we get on with the project. And what was written down gets forgotten about 